Good evening, Manitoba. I'm Larry McIntosh. I'll be your host for the next hour. I want to welcome you to this special September long weekend edition of Food and Friends. Now, Food and Friends is normally on Saturday mornings from 8 to 9, but we have the privilege of having an extra show uh, for you, and we're glad to be with you this evening. See, I wanted to start out by saying good morning, because that's where we always are, but it is evening, so good evening. I hope you're having a great long weekend, and uh, thanks for tuning in. Now, it's September, and the kids are going back to school. It, it may feel like summer is ending, but it isn't over yet. All, and all you have to do is look at the amount of harvesting that's going on in the fields. We have lots of Manitoba-grown vegetables coming off the fields right now. And here's a quick update of Manitoba-grown vegetables available in your local store right now. Green beans, beets, broccoli, green, red, and savoy cabbage, carrots, cauliflower, corn, kale, leeks, cooking and red onions, green and jalapeno peppers, red potatoes, which just started, green acorn squash, and spaghetti squash. And coming up this week is russet potatoes and rutabagas, and they're all coming off the field. So there's lots of Manitoba-grown vegetables out there. So when you visit your local store tomorrow or this week, please support locally grown products. And as always, if it says peak of the market on the label, you're a guaranteed it is grown right here in Manitoba. My guest this evening is Lisa, D- Lisa Diesick, Director of Marketing and Communications from the Children's Museum. Good evening, Lisa. Good evening, Larry. It's a pleasure to see you today. How was your long weekend? It was excellent. Yeah? Absolutely wonderful, yeah. It, yeah. It's September, though. Doesn't that seem really odd? I, time flies. It's amazing. You blink and it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to sh- share some trivia with you. This is show number 199 of Food and Friends, 199. And this is the first time we've ever been on a 7 o'clock at night. Normally we're earlier than this. We're not 7, 8 o'clock at night. So it's the first time we've been this late in the evening. And you're on the show almost exactly to the day three years ago. I think that's fabulous. And September 4th, 2011, you're on the show. So isn't that kind of cool? Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's great. And uh, again, I mean, it's it's fabulous to be able to be here and, and to have me back. It's been a lot of time in, in development here over the past couple of years. So it's great to be able to visit again. And, and I assume at the Children's Museum, it's a, it's very busy during the summer with everybody <laughs> being out of school. Would that be correct? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, summertime is generally the busiest season at the museum. We've got all the tourists that come in. The Forks is a very, very obviously busy tourist attraction to begin with. Um, Lots of day camps. We've got our own programming that runs throughout the the entire summer. So, yeah, it's, it's active, just completely active. So are you happy it's now, you know, <laughs> September long weekend's done and things will calm down? Or Well, I don't know that, that things ever really calm down at a children's museum. If it is, we're not doing our jobs, really, is is probably the best way to look at it. But uh, I would say that September is our slowest or slower yeah. uh, period as well, because with the kids going back to school, we tend to have uh, fewer school group bookings during that month. And so just general visitors tend to come and they're grandmas, moms, dads stay at home. They come in with their toddlers. And so it, it tends to be a little little quieter, a little slower, more relaxed. It's, it's a great time to visit if you've got the opportunity. Yeah, I was going to say you probably have a younger average age than you would during the summertime because there's still kids that aren't in school yet. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, we, we pretty much drop from um, summer visitors average, I think, six to ten years old. Um, and then back, back by school time, we're four and under. So, yeah, it, it kind of alternate significantly. And then in September, we also relaunch. Um, we've got this programming called Mini Mondays, which is very specific programming uh, for toddlers, which is all developmentally geared towards their age, towards their gross motor skill development. Um, so yeah, we, we actually program deliberately for that audience too. Hmm. So do you take summer holidays or do you have to take them in September? Uh, <laughs> holidays. Uh, we're, we're you marketing. get holidays. I, I know you say, get holidays. Marketing department, <laughs> army of one. Uh, yeah. Holidays are, are a great thing to have. But no, I, I tend to take it in our slower period, which kind of is great for me because I do. I love fall. Fall's fabulous. So it's a great time to take it. It's a great time of year. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Rutabagas and, and russet potatoes, was that it? Coming up this week? I want to. I actually want to say that again and again. I've been thinking <laughs> about it since you said it already. So I won't ask you to name all those vegetables alphabetically I or got, anything. No, I got two, but... You got the last two, which are coming off the fields this week. That's important. I mean, there, there's so many wonderful vegetables coming off. And it's a, I love the summertime for obvious reasons. We're in the business, and there's tons of crops coming off. And we have a lot of storage crops. Carrots and potatoes can be stored for long periods of time. But it's just it's a great time of year. 
Yeah, it's, you know, it's actually sort of interesting too. Uh, Children's Museum this past year, we actually launched, it's called the Rural Access Program. And uh, what it is, is programming that brings rural students into the city. Uh, we'll do some transportation subsidies. We'll provide free school programs. Hmm. It's all sponsored. A lot of our sponsors are ag sponsors. And so it's great to have the agricultural community sort of rallying and getting their students to come into the city for a different experience, too. So it's a unique opportunity. Out of all your visitors you have uh, on a normal year, how many would be from out of province? Would it be a large percentage? or? Uh, well, again, time of year tends to tends to be the main factor, too. There's not a lot of um, tourists in January? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful well, you time. know what? Everybody wants to come to Winnipeg, absolutely, during that time of year. Um, but no, summer summertime, we're almost, I would say, uh, 40% visitors, like, to the province. Um, some, I mean, overseas visitors, very frequent. I expect with the opening of the Canadian Museum for Human Rights that we'll also have increase in, in um, travel visitors, too. We just had Stuart Murray on the show, so yeah, oh, we're great. up to date on the Human yeah. Rights Museum, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That so, should bring in some more traffic to the Forks? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we're all we're all thinking that'll be the case, and we're actually uh, we're going to be involved with their opening weekend. They're doing, it's called Rights Fest, and so sort of a weekend long of programming for their for the grand opening. So it'll be neat. We'll be able to have some, some programming set up outside the museum, and it'll be offered free to all the guests that are able to pop by and check out the space. Great. Great. We'll be right back with Lisa Diesick, Director of Marketing and Communications from the Children's Museum, after we take this break. For your 680 CJOB weather update. Welcome back to the special long weekend edition of Food and Friends. As I said before, Food and Friends is normally on Saturday mornings from 8 to 9, but we have the privilege of having an extra show and being with you this evening. So thanks for joining us. Now, this is normally the coaches show with Bob Irving, but They'll be here tomorrow night, so we got this slot tonight. Food and Friends Radio is now on TV. Each radio show is filmed and will be posted on mytoba.ca. So if you want to see the TV version of this show or previous radio shows, please visit mytoba.ca. And thanks to 680C Joe B's Nicole Bonnycamp, who produces our show, and Chad, who operates the camera, as well as the teachers of the Broadcasting and Media Arts Program at TechVoc High School. You can also listen to an audio podcast of Food and Friends at SoundCloud.com and at the iTunes Store. So please just do a search for Food and Friends with Larry at MyToba.ca or SoundCloud.com or the iTunes Store, and all the shows will come up for your listening and viewing pleasure. It's very important for me to mention that Food and Friends is only available because of 680C Joe B and its advertisers. So please make sure you tune in to 680C Joe B or listen live at cjob.com. We're back with Lisa Disick, Director of Marketing and Communications from the Children's Museum. So last time you we were on the show, which we said was about three years ago, I asked the question, do you ever close down to clean? Like, you know, sometimes you just need that week to clean things up. And you're saying off air, it's coming up. Yeah, yeah, it sure is. We're actually closed uh, from from Tuesday to Friday of this week. Of this week. This week. Yeah. So it was great that we invited you it to come on to say, "Come timing. on down." Come on down. <laughs> well, you know what though? Come on down for the weekend because we're going to be brand brand new, resparkling, super shiny and clean. It'll be great. We do all of our facility maintenance during our closure period. That's when we test all the smoke alarms and sprinkler systems and everything like that. I mean, that kind of goes on year round, anyways. But we we get the actual professionals in to to service all the equipment, make sure that things are performing well for the kids. It's great. Well, as you're saying, the busiest summer summer's your busiest time, and then people are getting back to new routines. Whether you have kids back to school, it's a short week, whatever. It seems like an ideal time to get all that done and then get back on the road again, so to speak. Yep. Yeah, it's a good time to to reboot. Really. Reboot, reboot. That's reboot. well put. Yep. So, how long has the museum been around? Uh, well, we opened up in, it would have been 1986, Okay. and originally the museum opened up on Pacific Avenue, and it was a much smaller space. I think we had about three, well, three original galleries, and then they grew to four. They tried growing up to five and found they just didn't have the space. So that was when, in 1994, we actually moved to the Forks, and that's where we're home now. But three years ago, when I actually came and visited and chatted with you then, uh, it was right after our grand reopening. We had done a $10 million capital campaign. Right. We'd completely refurbished all of our galleries, renovations. We added on a welcome center addition to the front of the building. Um, went from, I guess we had six galleries in the old space up to 12 now. 
um, totally different model of, of learning and, uh, and guided activities for the kids in, in our space from what the old space used to be. Mm-hmm. So it was, like I said, I mean, it was a significant development, and it's been a, a love of labor, a labor of love over the past close to 30 years, really. And I haven't been to the museum for a few years because my daughter's, you know, in her 20s and she wouldn't want to go with me, I'm sure. But uh, when I was there, it was not too long after the renovation. It looked amazing. And do you still have the train there? That's what I was thinking about. We do, yeah. Yeah, the train is um, really, besides being an iconic piece of the Children's Museum, uh, the building itself is an old train repair facility. Mm. And so we really... I mean, besides, like I said, it being iconic, it, it really formed sort of the backbone of the space. I mean, to try to pull that thing out. Not that we would want to anyways, mm-hmm. since it's tied to the history and heritage of the building. Um, yeah, we, we did do some renovations to it, though. The engine itself is still maintained in the same sort of fashion that it used to be. Um, but we did add lights and some accessibility panels um, so that kids, if they're in wheelchairs or uh, they've got special mobility equipment, they can actually still see the insides of the train uh, simply by being able to view through these panels now, oh, okay. which is great. And then the old Pullman passenger cart that used to be a favorite for its very cramped, very narrow seating. Uh, we actually completely renovated that space into Storyline, which is a literacy-based gallery now. So much different than, than it used to be if you're accustomed to the old space. Is is the gallery you talked about? You said you had twelve now. Is that yep. twelve now? Yep. Is that is it education based or is it activity based or all of the above or? Well, uh, we it is all of the above. I'd say uh, we exist to spark kids creative learning, and so in doing that, we do that through discovery learning and hands on learning. Um, unlike very traditional museums, which which maintain historic. Um, uh, historic artifacts or any sort of cultural pieces that, that are stanchioned off or anything like that. Um, we believe that kids learn through playing and through interacting with their environment. And so really, I mean, that's, that's what you see. It's not just a giant play structure. As kids grow and as they age through the space, they'll, got, they'll actually get to see and get to learn different things at each different developmental stage that they're in. So it, it really is a multi-level um, learning opportunity for them throughout their development. And how, how old would the kids be? What, what age range would they be to come to the museum? Uh, well, we, we cater to kids that are 1 to 10. One to ten. So that's... One to ten. Yeah, we've got a toddler specific gallery called Tot Spot, um, and as I was, yep, <laughs> yeah, it's actually a mini children's museum within the children's museum. Oh, okay. So lots of lots of elements that are recreated from our bigger galleries, but on very very tiny toddler level, and we we try to uh, we try to discourage big kids from going in that space just for the safety of the young ones, mm-hmm. and uh, and yeah, like like I said, I mean it's it's a great opportunity for them to be able to go through the. Um, through the galleries and actually experience all the different different exhibits that are in the space. We'll be right back with Lisa Disick, uh, Director of Marketing and Communications from the Children's Museum after we take this break. Welcome back to the special long weekend edition of Food and Friends. Food and Friends is normally on Saturday mornings from 8 to 9, and we hope you'll tune in on Saturday. But we have the privilege of having an extra show and being with you this evening. Now, I don't want to talk about summer ending because it isn't. I'm just going to continue saying it's not ending yet. But the kids are going back to school soon. It also means that fundraising will begin very shortly. For all of you involved in school or daycare fundraising in some way, I just want to talk about the Manitoba uh, Farm to School Manitoba Healthy Choice Fundraiser. This fundraiser is open to all Manitoba schools, private or public, K-12, and all licensed daycares anywhere in Manitoba. Basically, the fundraiser works like this. The student sells bundles of Manitoba-grown, peak-of-the-market vegetables to raise money for their school or daycare. It could be raise money for a school band trip, sporting event, uh, whatever, new equipment. Bundle A has carrots, cooking onions, and red potatoes and sells for $10. And Bundle B has larger packs of carrots, red potatoes, and cooking onions, as well as green cabbage and parsnips, and it sells for $20. The great thing about this fundraiser is the school or daycare keeps half the selling price. Now, this fundraiser has been going for three years now, and this is the fourth year. But last year, the fundraiser uh, raised $414,000 for the Manitoba schools and daycares that participated. That means 
they kept $414,000 towards their project. So it's a, a great funds raiser. It's healthy. It's selling vegetables. It's good all around. And the fundraiser runs until December 10th and is open to any Manitoba school or licensed daycare anywhere in the province of Manitoba. So if you're interested in getting more information on the Farm to School fundraiser or to register your school or daycare, please visit their website at farmtoschoolmanitoba.ca. That's farmtoschoolmanitoba.ca. Or just visit peakmarket.com, and we have a link there. We'll be right back after we take this break. Welcome back to Food and Friends, our special long weekend edition. Now, Food and Friends is normally on Saturday mornings from 8 to 9, and we hope you'll join us on next Saturday. But we have the privilege of having an extra show and being with you this evening. I'm really excited to announce that Peak of the Market now has a mobile recipe app. It is available free through Apple, Android, or the BlackBerry World app stores. And all you have to do is go to one of these sites and do a search for Peak Recipes. The Peak Recipes app has, o- app has over 4,000 recipes at your fingertips. And you can do some neat things. You can search options like potatoes or chicken, whatever you want to put in there. You can rate the recipe so you know for future from one to five carrots what, what you like. Uh, and you can add it to your favorite list so you don't have to look it up every time. You can put it in a favorite section. You can add it to your shopping list. Uh, just click on it. It'll add all the ingredients to your shopping list, and you can check them on off as you buy them. Uh, you can also add items to that list if you need toothpaste or whatever it may be. You can refont, uh, resize the font. So if you're like me and are on the edge of needing glasses but haven't quite admitted it yet, you can make the font bigger. Now, there's thousands of apps out there, and we realize this, and we really hope that you'll try ours to see how neat it is. But we're going to give you an incentive. For every person who downloads the free Peak Recipe app by October th- uh, 31st of this year, Peak of the Market growers will donate 20 pounds of fresh vegetables, up to 1 million pounds, to the Winnipeg Harvest Food Bank. And as we all know, Winnipeg Harvest shares food with food banks throughout our province. So if you do it by October 31st, this free app, no obligation, you will donate 20 pounds of fresh vegetables to the food bank. So we're very excited by our new mobile app, and we can help others less fortunate than ourselves by downloading it before the end of October. October. We are back with Lisa Disick, a Director of Marketing and Communications from the Children's Museum. Now, we were talking off air, you have events all the time. What's what's new and exciting coming up at uh, the Children's Museum? Uh, well, if we want to go and fast forward to 2015. 2015? Wow, it's 2015. only September, but okay. I know, I know, but we're, we've been planning years already for our upcoming exhibitions. Um, in spring of 2015, we're actually going to be opening up a new exciting exhibition called Hands-On Harley-Davidson. Harley-Davidson? Yep. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a licensed Harley-Davidson exhibition, um, and literally it's, it's based on the, um, the outcome, the learning outcomes of science, technology, engineering, and math. There's going to be a real, real live Harley-Davidson in the building. Uh, kid size, of course, so that kids are able to ride it and dream it and build it. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, it should be a much different uh, different draw than some of the previous exhibitions that we've done. Like, for example, this past year we did The Adventures of Mr. Potato Head, which was Which is fantastic. Classic. Fantastic. Yeah. I love Mr. Potato Head. Yeah, and then we just came off uh, this past summer. We actually hosted, a, first time in Canada, an exhibition called Tapescape, which was all made out of packing tape. Just <laughs> really? layers and layers and layers of packing tape that... Uh, that formed these incredible cocoon-like tunnels that kids could crawl through. It was it was fabulous. Not only did it look great, it, I mean, it looked like a piece of art on its own, but yet there was actually learning objectives and learning outcomes linked to it. Now, this may be an obscure uh, reference, but Red Green it has that show with it fixes everything with duct tape. I think it is. So he wasn't there, though, right? The, the no. tape was. <laughs> no, he <laughs> But I had wasn't. to throw that out there because I remember somebody's yeah. name. <laughs> yeah, but no, I, I'll tell you what. When I was making a sign, I had a moment where, where I was feeling quite red-green myself because we were giving away some duct tape wallet kits and things like that as part of our marketing. And, uh, and yeah, I was, I was actually trying to figure out how I was going to write an education panel that explained conic sections <laughs> to to children that were were about three to ten years old and I don't even understand them <laughs> so it was it was a challenge and I had a moment and all I could keep thinking was duct tape duct tape could solve this so this is going to be another obscure thing but Shelley and I were a week ago Saturday we we're in the Morden corn and apple festival we were the grand marshals and the reason I'm telling you this so we got to ride in the parade it was really cool thousands and thousands of people it's a great event so I highly recommend checking it out next year when it comes around but three has a factory in that area. So they were giving out on the sidelines to the kids duct tape or whatever their version of duct tape is, their wide tape. Yeah. Yeah. 
out. That's awesome. Isn't that neat how I could tie a story in that's totally unrelated that. to, to your that. event? Yeah, yep. it's very neat. So you have events throughout the years. Yep. You're, you have an uh, adult fundraiser you're mentioning? We do, yeah. We've got uh, a special, special new event series called Hashtag Seriously Adult. And so what we're, what we're trying with that is to bring in adults into the space a couple times a year for special one-off events. For example, the first one that we hosted was a trivia night. So idea was buy a table and, and come out, challenge yourself to rounds of our trivia that we're offering okay. and compete with others. Um, right away, we're actually hosting the second one in the series, which is a comedy night. So we've got Big Daddy Taz will be out, and he'll be oh, hosting it. Great guy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, two local comedians. There's there's uh, Matt Falk and Chris Funk, and so they'll be out. Uh, one is a writer for Celebrations, and and he's done all sorts of other comedy writing. The other one uh, actually does. Uh, me, a magician too like he does magic in addition to, to his comedy act and <laughs> should be really really fabulous so and when's that uh that'll be september 12th so next friday already. oh wow it's coming up yeah. yeah it's coming up pretty soon are and, there uh, tickets available you're sold out no no we have a couple tickets still available um, as in two or <laughs> it, you know what when i last checked literally i think two tables oh, were, which, wow, okay. which isn't which isn't tons but mm -hmm. uh but no, it's it's been going great. We even offer a child minding service during the event. Um, again, being that we're trying to bring adults into the space, lots of them have kids, and we need to be able to provide almost a babysitting type of care care during the the program so that they can not worry about having to. Well, Big Daddy Taz and the other gentlemen are very funny people. I've seen. I think I think I've seen all three of them or talked to them anyway. Uh, so it's highly recommended that you go. So how would they get tickets if there's, there's still some available? Just on our website at childrensmuseum.com, or you know you're welcome to come down to the space, and our admissions staff would be would be more than happy to sell you a ticket. So sure. childrensmuseum.com, September 12th. So you got to do it soon if yeah. you're going to go, and hopefully there'll be tickets available still tomorrow when people make that. Well, they sure. could do it today on the website, I guess. True. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Good. So that's coming up next. Do you have something big for Christmas? Oh, yeah, always. We uh, we host the Eaton's Fairy Tale Vignettes during the holiday season. So from mid-November until mid-January or so, we bring out, there's 15 historic uh, fairy tale vignettes that used to be in the downtown Eaton's building's oh. front display windows. And they're all these animatronic fairy tales that are being brought to life by by electricity that we're powering. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's a great time. We bring in, um, we host a, a whole series of events that, that are sort of linked in some way, shape, or form to the vignettes. So we will host a seniors holiday tea because a lot of the seniors in our community remember going downtown and, and you know, looking in the shop windows right. and seeing these characters. And then uh, we do spaghetti breakfast with Santa because, well, what kid doesn't want to eat spaghetti for breakfast and then go see the vignettes? And, uh, is there like red sauce on the spaghetti? Because that'd be cool if you're Santa, you wouldn't get the sauce on. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, that's, absolutely. I'm just thinking of myself there, but yeah. <laughs> in the beard, though, in the beard, he always yeah, comes out that's with. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, little little bit of sauce in the beard, but uh, but no. And then one of the uh, most popular events that that almost surprised us with the popularity of it is our Top Hats and Tiaras family New Year's Eve event. Oh, really? Yeah. We, we ring in the New Year at noon for the kids, and so we do a balloon drop in our Times Square gallery. Um, we do ginger ale toasts, like a champagne toast, but with ginger ale, and there's there's all sorts of pizza appetizers going around. There's, um, yeah, yeah, it's just a great, a great event. We'll be right back with Lisa from the uh, Children's Museum after we take this break. Welcome back to the special long weekend edition of Food and Friends. Food and Friends is normally on Saturday mornings from 8 to 9, but we have the privilege of a, having an extra show and being with you this evening. Please follow Peak of the Market on Twitter at Peak of the Market for recipe and Manitoba veggie crop updates. We have over 100,000 Twitter followers from all over the world, and we'd love to have you follow us too. Again, we're at Peak of the Market, and my Twitter account is at Larry McIntosh. We're back with Lisa Disick, uh, Director of Marketing and Communications for the Children's Museum. Now, we were talking before the show started this morning, not this morning, this evening. See, I'm going on the whole morning thing still, um, about the Children's Museum. It used to be called the Manitoba Children's Museum, did it not? Yeah, and technically, legally, it still is. Really? Yep. Yeah, it still is. However, during our rebranding back in 2011 when we did our major capital campaign, uh, we went through quite an extensive rebranding process and looked at 
promotionally the use of the name simply Children's Museum. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, right now we're, we're lucky to be the only ones in our community that host a Children's Museum. There aren't other ones in Manitoba. And again, I mean, we had a lot of users that, that were calling us the Winnipeg Children's Museum mm -hmm. or simply Children's Museum already. So again, I mean, it made a lot of sense. I bet the majority of people probably just call it the Children's Museum because we abbreviate everything in, always. in life, right? Yeah, always. Yeah. People call us Peak of the Market, but most people just call us Peak, which is a compliment because people know what that means, right? That's right. Yeah. So you're you're talking about an event for artists uh, when we're when we're in commercial there. Well, I didn't really understand what that. But what is what is a commercial or so artist? <laughs> Not a, what is a commercial. We know what that is. An artist event. Yeah, we have um, for the first time ever. We're going to be hosting our our new fundraiser, which we're really hoping is going to be successful in our community here. Uh, it's called The Brush Off. Mm. And the idea is that we have 15 local artists who will be painting in four different challenge rounds in front of a live audience. So that's that's the people that actually purchase tickets and go to the event. You can watch these artists paint live in four rounds of competition. And they're competing in an elimination process to, to be voted best artist of the evening is is the idea behind it. Hmm. So it could be, like I said, it could be very, very cool. Uh, we've got a wonderful lady named the Auctionista. Her name is Linda, and she's coming in from um, Ontario to help us out, and, and she's going to be hosting the event with us and doing all sorts of live and silent auctions of the art that, that the artists are making, as well as our own silent auction prizes, things like that. Um, it, it really, like I said, it should be a really unique take on it. It's been tried at several children's museums around, around North America already. And, uh, it, it seems to be a very successful format. Hmm. And so, like I said, I mean, when we, when we're able to bring in artists, it's just fabulous. I, we, we love working with visual artists. And so it's just a great opportunity to connect with them and be able to bring in some other, other different um, people into the Children's Museum than they might normally be. And how many events would you do different things over the course of the year? And, then, and before you answer that question, <laughs> the thing I'm really fascinated by on this is your kids up to 10 years old is kind of what it's, the program is all about, if you call it that. But there's lots of different things that adults can get involved in that don't have kids anymore. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know what? I, I don't even know if off the top of my head I could name all of our events. We, we probably do... Three? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, three, three perfect, just like that. Uh, three a week sometimes, three a day sometimes. Um, but we do, we do. I would say on average anywhere from four to six a month of some sort. Um, most of the time it's weekend programming because that's when when the bulk of our audience comes to visit. Right. Um, but at the same time, again, I mean, we're we're running um, twice a year. We do an annual fundraiser. Uh, we do. Those are, those are the adults' events. I mean, we do special events like our Halloween Howl that's coming up pretty soon, too. Um, as I mentioned, the Top Hats and Tiaras event, we bring in, each year we bring in a special temporary exhibition, too. And that one will last several months, like Hands on Harley Davidson. So, yeah, there, there's always something going on. I mean, my, my job doesn't lack for, for creativity and plenty of ample uh, opportunity to input. Well, that's one of the questions I was going to ask you is how do you keep coming up with new ideas? And you said you, <laughs> you, there's another, other children's museum did the, the art one, so you can get that. But that's a lot of things to continue coming up with and reinventing. And there's probably events that are successful and others that maybe you won't redo or they only come one time. How do you keep that fresh? You know what? Uh, the place itself has got such potential um, I mean, we've got a really, really great staff team. They're all incredibly creative. They, they, they're all unique personalities, and they're always bringing new things to the table. Um, when we're really desperate, we might do a special children's advisory committee and, and poll them for some ideas. Mm -hmm. We can go into our community and ask for ideas, too. Um, but again, I mean, with with all that's out there, both internet and and just in the community period, there's never a want of, of an opportunity. More so, it's a want of money, a lack of funding to be able to do everything that we want to do. And, and there's 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 lots of opportunities out there. I understand that. But you also, you're not competing with other places, but you're competing for fundraising dollars. Oh. Uh, so you have to come up with something that somebody else hasn't done, something unique, something different. Yeah. Uh, that's got to be a challenge. Yeah. Um, right now, I mean, the the fundraising event state of our of our city is a little tough. I mean, it, it is yeah. a harsh 
a, a harsh place to be right now. We've got a lot of major projects going on. Um, a lot of our local, our large lead donors are already tied up in large projects. And that's it. I mean, by by refreshing and, and creating new events on a semi-regular basis, I mean, we're able to find new audiences that may not be tapped into some of those other or, or committed to some of those other events that are, you know, 25th annual, for example. Right. Yeah. Well, kudos to you and your uh, co-workers for coming up with new ideas and involving adults and bringing in money to make it great for the children, that uh, the younger about. children. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. exactly what it's about. Good for you. We'll be right back with Lisa Diesick, Director of Marketing Communications from the Children's Museum, after we take this break. Welcome back to Food and Friends. Join me next Saturday morning from 8 to 9 when my guest will be Sam Cates, the Mayor of Winnipeg. Mayor Cates will tell us about some of his greatest accomplishments, at least I'll ask about some of his greatest accomplishments, that he'll be proud of, that he was proud of why he was Mayor of Winnipeg. And, of course, the election's coming up next month, and we're going to lose Mayor Sam, but uh, we're happy to have him in here. Whew, this is, I'm really stumbling over this part. Mayor Sam Cates will be in, in Saturday morning from 8 to 9. My guest today has been Lisa Disick, Director of Marketing and Communications for the Children's Museum. Well, thank you, Lisa, for being on Food and Friends. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. It's Like I said, I mean, I love that, love that I'm able to be here. Love that you invited me. It's a great opportunity. So if people are looking for information on how to donate or the events coming up, the website once again? website is www.childrensmuseum.com. And you're closed the rest of this week for, renov- not renovations, cleaning and maintenance, etc. Cleaning, et cetera. maintenance, facility, yep. But yep, open again exactly. on next Saturday? On the Saturday, yep. Fantastic. Well, thank you for being on the show. So much for me. Thanks to Nicole Bonnycamp, our show's producer. Take care and please, don't forget to eat your veggies. <laughs>